welcome back. And today we'll be talking about Derrida's excerpt from Plato's Pharmacy from his book, Dissemination. Now, before I go into it, I need to answer that question that Aaron had posted about what is it in Rousseau that he criticizes. Now, I must apologize. I don't have access to my books. They're all in my campus office. So uh, the discussion of Rousseau happens in Derrida's book of grammatology. Okay. And there are quite a few things that Rousseau claims, and especially uh, Derrida is focusing on um, his confessions. But we already know that uh, Rousseau, as a romantic, right, was responding to mostly the majority of people working around him, because instead of believing into that mechanistic view of state, right, by Hobbes or others, or larger systems of state, what he romanticizes is the idyllic life, where face-to-face -face encounters were possible, where speech was the only necessary medium. And so that's why he, he comes up with the concept of the noble savage and creates this binary between nature and culture. And culture for him is something that corrupts nature. And, and the method to save ourselves or whatever is a return to nature. Now it's that binary structure that kind of structures part of his confessions and his other works too. And it's that binary structure that Derrida is challenging, right? Now in that writing also, um, Rousseau talks about writing itself because what he says is that as I write, I'm trying to capture my thoughts, but in the process of writing, I feel like I want to embellish my thoughts, my ideas, and that's why he calls it a dangerous supplement, right? And what Derrida then is playing with is his use of the term supplement, right? And what Derrida suggests is, first of all, that the supplement has dual meanings. It's polysemous. But before I go there, the book is entitled Dissemination. And what do we mean by it? Here is one possible definition by someone. The possibility of an action or work, such as a work of art, purely belonging to an A agent and its merit returning to them alone is undermined by dissemination. Let's try to decipher that. Now, any attempt at retrieving the authorial intention, or if I'm taking speech to be a representation of the logos, logos to be a representation of sun, God, whatever, an assumption that I can trace the origin from that is, is what is contaminated by dissemination. Now, we can go to it through Hume as well. Now, remember, in, in his famous book, you know, when Hume is trying to explain that, that the effect cannot explain the cause, his example is that of a billiards table, right? And he says, okay, um, you know, if I look at the space of these balls on a table, there is no way I can trace the origin of them because the, the permutations of thousands of permutations. So this argument that we can somehow retrieve the original cause through the, through the effects, it's impossible, right? Now, this is kind of the same version of it because dissemination within a text then is that meaning is spread. There is an endless chain of signification and to assume that we can retrieve one single author or the ideas of one single person through a text it is contempt is problematic because the text is disseminated right and then he goes on to the question of supplementarity right the supplement right so there's a whole essay on supplement you can follow this link but i'm Quoting from that essay, Derrida 
Derrida takes this term from Rousseau. As I just mentioned, Rousseau uses his writing as a dangerous supplement, who saw a supplement as an inessential extra added to something complete in itself. So when Rousseau is writing about writing, what he's saying is that this, this writing, this supplement is dangerous because it encourages me to embellish and add materials to what I am trying to mem remember, right? And that memory for him then in a binaristic structure is in its pure form, right? Derrida argues that what is complete in itself cannot be added to one, right? So you cannot add a supplement to something that you think is already complete. So how can there be a supplement to memory if it is already complete, right? And so a supplement can only occur where there is an originary lack. We can only supplement something that originally needed a supplement. At the mo moment of its origin, it must have a lack. In any binary set of terms, the second can be argued to exist in order to fill in an ordinary, ordinary lack in the first place. Now, there's another way of talking about the supplement, and that is its dual meanings. And I'm going to go to my phone here, and that's another source that I'm using. So Derrida seizes upon the fact that supplement, which is called, I think, supplier in French, can mean not only to supplement, to add on to, but also to take the place of, to substitute for, right? So supplement is paradoxical. It can mean adding something on to something already complete in itself or adding on something to complete a thing, right? These are the two meanings that Derrida saying are operative. And then he takes that and reads Rousseau and deconstructs his claims because he's saying there is a slippage between the two usages of the term. And this is a, 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 an, a brilliant Derridian technique. Uh, you will see a lot of deconstructionists use it. For example, in, in Gayatri Spivak's famous essay, Can the Sub Subaltern Speak? Uh, when she is talking about Deleuze saying that representation has withered away. She's saying, but representation has two kinds, right? There is one that is about representation, standing in for someone, political representation. And there is another representation where we represent something in an art form. Which representation are we talking about? Because then she goes on to point out that there is a slippage between the two terms in what Deleuze is saying. So this is the same thing Derrida is doing. The supplement can either be something that is added to something that is complete or which was incomplete at the originary moment, at the moment where it was conceived, or it can be added to something that is already complete as an addition, right? So that is what he calls the logic of supplementarity, right? Then, before I go on to Plato's pharmacy and the excerpt that you all read, my question is, now why does Derrida choose this particular dialogue of Plato? And he explains his reasons of choosing this particular dialogue in the part of the chapter in dissemination, which is not included in your uh, in the extract that you read. And the reason he gives is um, right after the first few paragraphs, he says, okay, here is the secret of this text. People have considered it either an early Plato work and hence not mature enough, or a later Plato, Platonic work where Plato was too old to actually do real good philosophy, and hence it has been considered peripheral to the main dialogues of Plato. So in a deconstructive mode, as I told you earlier also, what he's doing is, uh, okay, so before I go there, Aaron, what I mean is slippage of the two meanings of the same term, that when it is used, 
sometimes supplement is used uh, to mean that it's adding to the original, embellishing it, and another time it means that it is adding something that is not there. So by pointing out that imbalance or that slippage between the two meanings of the term supplement, he can then deconstruct the stability of the text from within. Because the text, how does it become stable, right? It relies on you, me, and everyone else to assume that it means what is being said. But if you can point out that, that these two meanings slip in at different places without announcing itself, you've already destabilized the text itself, right? That's what he means by or he would mean, um, yes, not homonyms. These are not homonyms. This is polysemy, right? It's one word. A homonym wants two words, right? It's the same word, but it's polysemous. It can have more than one meaning. And the slippage is between those two meanings. Good questions. All right. Uh, I'll go on. Uh, so I was ex trying to explain, you know, why does he choose this? So in the uh, original chapter, Derrida says, okay, I'm going to read this to make a case for writing. I'm not going to the obvious dialogue that everyone would go to, and that's the statesman, because that's where the question of writing is invoked and, and dealt with. So what he's then saying is, I'm going to pick up something peripheral to, Foucault, uh, to Plato's work, which has been considered peripheral. Then within that, I will pick up a concept or two which have traditionally been considered completely unimportant and peripheral. And then I will run them through this entire dialogue by a careful reading of it and prove to you that not only is this an important dialogue, but if we pay attention to the terms employed in the dialogue here and there, we can learn something new, a secret that the text held for centuries. So in the process of reading the dialogue, he is also teaching us one way of doing deconstruction. Remember, we talked about the three modes of deconstruction. So you pick up the binary structure, right? And you first try to destabilize the binaristic structure itself by pointing out here is the privileged binary speech, here is the non-privileged binary part writing, and then you first destabilize the, the dominant part of the binary itself and then go on to suggest that the peripheral part of the binary is actually more important. And that's what he does in this dialogue. Okay, so here is the beginning part of the excerpt that you read. So the dissimulation of the woven texture can in any case take centuries to undo. And this is when he's talking about a text, a web that envelops a web, undoing the web for centuries, reconstituting it too as an organism, indefinitely regenerating its own tissue behind the cutting trace. We talked about trace last time. The decision of each reading, there is always a surprise in store for the anatomy or physiology of any criticism that might think it has mastered the game, surveyed all the threads at once, deluding itself too in wanting to look at the text without touching it, without laying a hand on the object, without risking, which is the only chance of entering into the game. Okay, so this obviously, I mean, this is a criticism of Norton of Fry's anatomy of criticism, right? One, but also any attempt at writing about a text or reading a text where we talked about what is peripheral to the text, what is outside to the text, what he's suggesting is that is like you not getting your hand dirty. So the actual act of reading must involve this touching the fabric of the text itself, entering it, right? So that's why a lot of people say that deconstruction is in a, another form of close reading. The only difference is 
that in close reading, if you remember, in New Criticism, we were trying to find the harmonies of a text. We were trying to see how a text settles its tensions, right? Its expectations. How does it become an organic whole? Here, we are kind of doing the opposite. We are saying, this is what the text offers us, right? Now, let us see, can we unsettle the balances that are offered here? Can we undo the, the, um, the logic that it's offering because the logic is logic of supplementarity and not logic of differences, right, which are resolved. So that's his technique, which he's explaining right over here. Going back to the passage. So one must manage to think this out, that it is not a question of embroidering upon a text, unless one considers that to know how to embroider still means to have the ability to follow the given thread. That is, if you follow me, the hidden thread, if reading and writing are one, as is easily thought these days, if reading is writing, this oneness designates neither undifferentiated confusion nor identity at perfect rest. The is that couples reading with writing must read apart, rip apart. One must then in a single gesture, but doubled, read and write. And that person would have understood nothing of the game who at this would feel himself authorized merely to add on, that is to add any old thing, right? He would add nothing. The scene wouldn't hold. Okay, so any criticism must then be done Imagining the text as a fabric, following its weave, not bringing something from outside and saying, here is what I found about Rousseau. He was having a nervous breakdown and we can trace it on the text. Or here is my materialistic criticism of, you know, capital and then, no. You must enter the text and follow the weave. What is the we? What? How is a text structured, right? H how does it cohere? And then within that, what, what are the claims that it is offering? And then to undo it, you must find those moments in a text where you can say, okay, if I pull here, I can undo this text. That is deconstruction. That is what he's saying. And he's saying about Phaedrus, because what he's suggesting is, this dialogue that I am about to read, considered peripheral to Plato's oeuvre, I think is important in explaining how, while Socrates blames the sophists, right, for writing without knowing what he actually is doing is employing the logic of the sophists themselves. Hence, Plato is doing that. And that speech, which is assumed to be a direct connection to logos may not be so, right? That writing is not necessarily a supplement. It's something that speech needs at the originary moment. So that's what he's trying to do. Let me go on. The next slide. So the next slide is where he introduces the concept of the pharmacia. Okay. But here is the deal, the part that has been omitted in the excerpt that you got, right, uh, is the staging of the dialogue, which has been omitted. So how is the dialogue staged? The st and Derrida writes about it because that's also what makes this dialogue unique. This is the only dialogue that happens in the countryside by a riverbank. No other dialogue takes, uh, most dialogues, take place in the city. Actually, in the beginning, as Phaedrus and, and Socrates are talking, uh, Phaedrus tells him, you never come out of the city. And he said, well, the trees cannot teach me anything. So I stay in the city because men can teach me things. What has brought him out then, right, is the speech, right? There is a speech on love that Lysias, right, a sophist, a 
a rhetorician has written for Phaedrus. Phaedrus has not yet fully memorized the speech, but he wants Socrates' his opinion about the speech. And he offers to Socrates, he says, come, I will, read, I will read the speech to you and then you give me your opinion. And Socrates says, no, 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 no. You're holding that, that speech under your arm, that pharmacon, right? Let's, let's go outside the city, sit and let me read the speech, right? So it is the written word seductive as it is, that has drawn Socrates out of the city to the countryside. That's the first point in the staging of the, or what you call the mise-en-scene uh, of, of the dialogue, right? And then as they are sitting down, there are two myths that they talk about, right? So there are since they are in nature, they, they can hear cicadas. So they talk about the myth of the cicadas, right? And that is a myth about these men, right? Muses taught them to sing, right? And they got so deeply involved in singing that they forgot to eat and drink and hence died without knowing, right? And the muses then convert them into chick cicadas, giving them the power to sing for their entire lives, but also to observe and report on humans, right? To the muses, especially to report as to who is the one who is seeking the guidance from muses. So that's the one myth. The second myth is as they are sitting down by the river, they say, well, isn't it here that that young woman was taken away? I'm forgetting the name. Was, was taken away by, by Boreos, the winds, as she was playing with Pharmacia, right? So this is the second time in a brief span that the term Pharmacia, which is also a derivative of Pharmacon, right, is being mentioned, right? And there is a reason he's using that. What he's saying is, that I am going to pick up this term, right? No one has connected, why is it mentioned? And then I'm going to move through this dialogue because there is another moment where pharmacon is mentioned, right? And then I would tell you, here is what I think a pharmacon is. So he's theorizing the concept of the pharmacon, right? but theorizing it while reading a dialogue in which it is mentioned in different connotations. Okay. So another thing in the dialogue, I, I'm gonna go back to it in a minute. So they sit down, they read uh, the speech and, you know, uh, Socrates gives his opinion of love and how, well, what his argument is that the sophist writes without knowing. And the speech argues that, you know, this is what a lover should say to the beloved. And he's like, no, this is not how you start. This is what a lover will say at the end. And then there is a question of what relationship is better, a lover to lover or a lover to non-lover, which one is based in reason, which one is based in passions, right? But the point here is reading this dialogue to a point where the question of writing comes up, right? And that's where Plato introduces a dialogue that he himself, uh, a myth that he himself writes, okay? And that myth, is not from Greek mythology. And that's the myth of the god Theus, right? Who creates a grammata, right? Who creates alphabet. And who, when he goes to the god Amon, right? The god of gods. And he gives his gifts to the god. And then he says, here is a pharmacon. I have invented writing. And if you... If we give it to the Egyptians, they will be able to become wiser and they will be able to record their memories. That's the myth, right? That's the myth that Derrida is playing with because as writing is offered to the god, to the sun god, 
as a pharmacon. Pharmacon means two things. It can mean a poison or a remedy, right? So it's undecided. The status of writing is undecided, right? Now it's the Sun King who will either say, yes, give it to the people and they will prosper and become wiser. Then it becomes a remedy. Or if the Sun King says, no, this will weaken their memories and make them forget, make them less intelligent. That is actually a platonic argument. That's what writing does. But writing until that decision comes from the God, from the sun God is ambivalent. It is a pharmacon. It can be either this or that, right? And that is the concept then, concept of the pharmacon that he is theorizing throughout this essay. So here is a reading of Derrida's argument in this essay which someone else has done, and I'm going to go there. So Plato in the Phaedrus describes Logos as the father and king to suggest its authority in relation to writing, which should obediently represent truth, but which can also lead truth astray. This was Plato's quarrel with the Sophists, who taught youth to use language to argue po points without tra training them in proper reasoning. Only when ideas are present in their truth and without true ideas, the techniques of representation, such as memorizing passages in order to repeat them, are the bearers of falsehood, right? That's Derrida's argument that this is what you blame the sophists for, that they teach rhetoric, right? but they don't teach a habit of thinking. And they encourage youth to just memorize and repeat. So what is repeatable, remember, is not original, right? An original event must be itself. So speech, he says, Plato would suggest, is what is original, what comes through the logos, right? Whereas writing, is a copy of a copy, right? And if we just memorize writing and say it, we have not really understood anything, right? That is what the argument is. But so Derrida argues that this platonic opposition here, like most binaries, cannot be sustained, writing and speech. He notices points of ambivalence where the opposed terms weave together, much as the pharmacon weaves together two entirely incommensurable meanings, poison and cure. For example, true ideas such as beauty, justice, etc., can be true or eternal only by being infinitely repeatable, right? They must be compellingly, compellingly true a million years from now. Yet repetition is one of the characteristics of writing, of external signification that disqualifies it from truthfulness. Similarly, remembrance, which for Plato is our way of recalling true eternal ideas that live in our mind and are maintaining a living connection with them, cannot be cleanly separated from memorization, right? The external addition of a technique that bears no real living relation to ideas, right? So. So if, if writing is considered something that, it, that repeats itself and hence inferior to speech, right? What he's then suggesting is that speech itself, right? Is, is writing, right? Because it, it is repeatable. If I'm remembering it, that's a repetition. And if, it, if, if I'm remembering it, isn't it a kind of writing, right? There are other ideas that are coming from this too, like, okay, so what's at stake then? Think of it this way. I mean, when in his critique of Rousseau, what, what he talks about is when, when he talks about the lack and there is, you know, Foucault, uh, not Foucault, Rousseau, uh, when Rousseau is talking about fantasy, right, that he's imagining his love for his foster mother, right? And in the process of doing so, 
he realizes that any other sexual experience that he has had does not match with the kind of erotic feelings that he had for for his foster mother right he had never had a sexual relationship with it so what derrida is saying is that what's filling that gap that lack is fantasy itself right which is a supplement but that supplement is part of the originary experience itself right now during the dialogue in phaedrus um socrates also tells him tells phaedrus okay you know let me read the speech and then i will give you um you know i'll answer the question whatever uh in interest right or in whatever extra supplement comes out of it so there are three things that he mentions right god the father the son and capital all three of them in one way or the other have certain attributes the sun has its light right which gives us light that's one part of the binary light and dark that plato represents god um i'm going going to come to that so so logos god is speech right and writing is 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 its other and third capital is the original capital and the supplement is the interest that comes on it but what he is trying to suggest what derrida is trying to suggest is that the supplement is present at the originary moment because we also know through plato that we cannot look at the sun all we can experience is its attributes similarly logos that we talk about right it's only we can only access it through representation right speech is a representation we can't come face to face with god and sustain it right so in that sense then these things that are being offered as originally and untainted themselves are supplements or are supplemented right and hence that binary structure doesn't hold and what is considered an imitation and copy a copy actually becomes crucial to construction of the original right that's what he's talking about here all right let me go to the next slide if i have one then coming to the concept of the pharmacon right that is crucial so the translation of the pharmacon so there is a point in the essay or in the excerpt where uh, derrida is talking about as to how pharmacon has been translated and it has been translated as a remedy right now what he's saying is the translation of the pharmacon as remedy is not simply incorrect it is always going to be partial missing the mark such an interpretive translation is thus as violent as it is important it destroys the pharmacon but at the same time forbid forbids itself access to it leaving it untouched in its reserve the translation by remedy can thus be neither accepted nor simply rejected right okay so my note down there socrates in phaedrus tries to counteract the pharmacon of writing with his most effective medicine the living word of knowledge that is graven in the soul right socrates can counteract pharmacon with with pharmacon says derrida only because of the essential ambivalence of the pharmacon of writing right what is he saying that when socrates is talking about the pharmacon being a remedy he is saying that we know that by the knowledge engraven upon our souls what is engraven upon our souls it is a writing right it is a script right and that then proves that the the way we are imagining speech and writing dichotomy even in um platonic vocabulary there is a slippage right also um what he also talks about in this essay is is the irony that 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 plato you know um while indicting writing for not being original must also constantly write right and that irony is already pretty simple to to foreground so by the end of the essay what we have learned is all the negative attributes that are assigned to to writing that it it can be misleading 
it is unoriginal. Derrida goes into other works of the symposium and the dialogues, and he says, well, speech does that too. This is what it was attributed to speech by Plato himself. Uh, what? That it can mislead people, that magic is done through incantation, right? That people can mislead other people through speech and of all the bigger arguments about speech being a corrupting influence, right? Is that, I mean, what is Socrates charged of? I mean, he doesn't write and put pamphlets on the walls. He doesn't write the bull and nail it to the church. He speaks in public, right? So one of the charges is against him is corrupting the youth. How does he corrupt the youth? By speaking to them, right? So speech, if it were pure, and if writing is the one that misleads, speech does that too, right? And does that in Plato's own words. So by the time we finish dissemination, but Plato's pharmacy, what we realized is that this binary between speech and writing has been rendered, you know, unstable. And the concept of the pharmacon then is the concept that Derrida would use otherwise to, and what is that concept that to, to, to employ a word or a term, right? that can carry the trace of both the meanings, which is neither this nor that. And we dwell at that moment in the process of signification where, where it is ambivalent, right? So how do we use that? Okay, so let's say sex or gender. Either we either read it in a binaristic structure or if we read it as a pharmacon, then there is room in it to read the ambivalent space within there, right? Male, female, right? Or wisdom and madness. All of these, if read as not one singular meaning, but as a pharmacon, then allows us to read, um, you know, to read any text, to read its ambivalences, to read what it is eliding in the process of creating its stability. So overall, this essay, I mean, it's a really dense text, so we can't really do justice to it, is a great example of how to do deconstruction. And how to do deconstruction in is to follow the weave of a text, right? You can inform it by reading other texts adjacent to it or by the same author where the author has made certain claims. But what you're trying to do is not saying this is what this text means. What you're trying to say is that the way it means is by eliding this part of the binary, by asserting this. And all you need to do is undo that stability. So what you do is you then make the text undecidable. And when it has become undecidable, it is open to multiple interpretations, right? So that in a very simplistic sen sense is my reading and understanding of this um, uh, excerpt from dissemination. Um, I'm pretty sure I've missed a lot. So I will stop here and hope you have some more questions and I hope that I can answer them. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, Aaron, do let me know if I really answered your question or not, um, because that's important. But I do apologize. I don't have my books with me. And so I can't really go and read the actual passages and then develop a better response to your questions. Uh, to be honest, as a scholar, uh, I would tell you that with all these years of training, since I was not trained in philosophy, I still find reading Derrida very intimidating and hard. So uh, if you are feeling that way, you, you are in a very big company. Um, now, another thing to keep in mind, and I touched upon it, is, is how Gayatri Spivak, and remember, she's the one who had translated of grammatology in her essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? The reason she argues that Derrida is more use of, useful as a philosopher to all of us who work on the margins 
of gender, of race, ethnicity, post-coloniality is because he does not, in the process of reading a text, subsume the other in his argument. Actually, his deconstruction is to constantly pointing out the other of the normative structures and then explaining how we could read a text differently if we encountered this other and understood it. So it's that respect for the other, for the marginal, which Spivak calls the Derrida's ethical project and its efficacy for doing any kind of work in opposition to using discourse or Deleuze and others. That's her argument. Okay, Aaron, thank you. Uh, but yeah, we can have further conversations about this. Uh, any other questions? I know, and I apologize. I know I'm, I haven't done a good job of it, but um, this is the best I can do under the circumstances. Uh, but the best way to not really understand Derrida, but to get what he is doing would be to read Derrida carefully and then read the philosophers that he mentions so that we actually know what he's talking about. So, okay, where should we start with, good question, let me look at this. Where should we start with getting familiar with the Greek philosophers? Uh, throughout reading the excerpt, I felt like I was missing something in my, oh yes, so I mean, think of it this way, I mean, the best place to start would be to read Plato, right? Uh, and especially his dialogues. And that, it goes without saying that we all, those of us who study literature, need to know the, uh, the read poetics by Aristotle, who was Plato's student, right? And then I would recommend that if you get, and this is a bit of a money, that's why I recommend that people should get, literary scholars should get the Norton Anthology of Criticism. If you skip through it, you will see that the beginning part covers at least one important work from each, uh, you know, uh, early Greek philosopher. So that would be a good start. But beyond that, um, you know, at least read Plato, right, um, and, and Aristotle. So, okay. Good. So Russell has a great introduction. Good. So uh, to Western philosophy, it will be slightly dated. Keep that in mind, but do read it. Uh, if you want a general understanding of philosophy, uh, it is slightly conservative look at philosophy, but Will Durant's, uh, Will Durant's uh, story of philosophy. It's a really good, concise book. And what it does is it gives you uh, a chapter each on all the major philosophers of Western tradition. And then if you really want to read his take on what actually is philosophy, what it does, then he has another book called Pleasures of Philosophy. And I would highly recommend them. I read these books like when I was a captain in the army. I don't even know why I was reading them. I think one of my superiors recommended it. But I really enjoyed reading uh, story of philosophy because it kind of gives a succinct understanding of all the major philosophers. Now, the thing that you will note there is that Hegel is not very prominent in there, even though now when we read Hegel, we, we kind of respond to him, but do start there. And someone said, uh, I haven't also has a very in-depth, okay, good. So, um, and Dalton said that uh, Russell's, yeah, 100 pages are ancient philosophers. Good. And then if you just do a search on, uh, you know, empirical or materialistic philosophers, you will, you see, you'll encounter Hume, uh, you know, like uh, Marx, right? All these other people, especially the British empiricists, uh, and then consequentialists like John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, they are all really important. But I would say start with one simple book that is just introduction to philosophy, what it does, and then introduction to just basics of different philosophers, ancient and modern, and then you can build on that. And I highly recommend it. I absolutely, despite my reading and everything, I still feel like had I gotten 
you know, good education in philosophy, my work would have been much better, my published work, but also my teaching would have been much better. So I highly encourage you to get an introductory volume. I'll see uh, if I can find some good books and I'll post the links to the description of this video just for you to know here are some of my recommended books. All right, so any other questions? So I'm gonna finish the lecture here and hope it was useful to you. As always, send me your questions and I'll try to answer them maybe in a separate recording. But so far, I apologize for uh, not having covered a lot of this part of Derrida, but I'll maybe make another effort. But I thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining me.